All right, welcome to The Explainer. Today, we're jumping right into what everyone's talking about, GPT-5. And look, this isn't just another incremental update. We're talking about a fundamental shift in how we're all gonna be using AI. So let's get into it. Yeah, the do-it-all flagship model, that quote from OpenAI, it pretty much nails it. What they've built here is a single unified system. The idea is you can throw anything at it text, pictures, your voice, even a live video feed, and it just handles it all in one place. And honestly, that's the biggest piece of the puzzle. It's what makes everything else possible. So first things first, let's pop the hood and see what's really going on. The number one change here is this brand new unified engine. And I want to be clear, this isn't just them tweaking the old system. It's a complete architectural redesign from the ground up. You know how it used to be, right? You had to kind of juggle different models. It was like, Okay, I need speed, so I'll use this one. Oh, but for this problem, I need the heavy-duty reasoning model. And wait, for this image, I need a different one altogether. Well, that whole song and dance, it's gone. GPT-5 just gets rid of all that complexity. So how does it do it? Well, think of it like this. Inside GPT-5, there's this really smart dispatcher, a dynamic routing system. It's got two main modes, or brains, if you will. There's GPT-5 main, which is optimized for speed and efficiency. You know, the quick stuff. Then there's GPT-5 thinking, for when you need some serious, deep reasoning on a complex problem. And the best part? You don't do anything. The system automatically routes your request to the right brain for the job instantly. And that flexibility? It also applies to the different sizes it comes in. You've got the standard model. That's the powerhouse for heavy-duty reasoning. Then there's many, your balanced everyday workhorse. And finally, nano, which is super lightweight and cost-effective for simple tasks. But here's the really cool part. Let's say you're a developer and you hit your usage limit on one of the bigger models. The system is smart enough to automatically switch you down to a smaller, cheaper one. So your work doesn't just grind to a halt. Super clever. Okay, so a slick new engine is great, but what does that mean for you and me? What can it actually do that's new and powerful? Let's get into the really exciting stuff. All right, let's kick this off with probably the biggest deal for anyone who uses these tools seriously. Accuracy. You've been there, right? When the AI just confidently makes something up. We call them hallucinations. Well, OpenAI is claiming a whopping 78% drop in those. Just let that sink in for a second. That's a massive leap in reliability. It's a difference between a fun, creative, but kind of flaky assistant and a tool you can actually trust for serious, important work. And that huge boost in accuracy is paired with something just as important, a gigantic memory. We're talking a 256,000 token context window. Now, I know that just sounds like a big technical number, but what it actually means in the real world, well, it changes the entire scale of what's possible. It means you can basically drop an entire novel into the chat, or a huge sprawling code base, or a massive stack of research papers, and it can process all of it at once without forgetting what was on page one by the time it gets to page 300. It can hold the entire thing in its head. For anyone doing deep research or complex analysis, this is an absolute game changer. But okay, the real headline grabber has to be its truly multimodal powers. It's not just about mixing text, images, and voice anymore. That's old news. Now, for the first time ever, you can interact with a live video feed. Seriously, just imagine this. You're staring at a confusing flat pack furniture manual. You point your phone's camera at it, and the AI literally talks you through building it step by step as you do it. On top of that, the voice mode itself is way more natural and less robotic. It's a huge step up. So all this new power is incredible, but who benefits the most? Well, while it's designed to be a tool for everyone, from creators to students, let's be real. Developers and coders are about to see their world change in a big way. Sam Altman, OpenAI's CEO, put it bluntly. He called it software on demand. And make no mistake, that is a direct challenge to all the specialized coding assistant tools out there. He's signaling a future where you don't just get help with code, you just ask for software and it gets built. So check this out. It's not just about generating snippets anymore. You can give it a single high-level request, something like, hey, build me a working physics simulation that shows the Bernoulli effect. And then you just wait. 
The AI acts like an autonomous agent. It goes to work in the background, writing the code, running tests, fixing its own bugs, and then, in a matter of minutes, it delivers a complex working application. It's wild. And it's not just for coders. That improved memory we talked about? It turns the AI into a real long-term partner. It can remember things you've told it, your preferences, facts about your projects, across different conversations, even days apart. So you could say, hey, I'm studying for my biology final in three weeks, and it will remember that goal, actively helping you and tailoring its answers to help you study over that whole period. It's much more proactive. Okay, but with all this incredible new power comes the big important questions. We have to talk about the reality check here, the safety, the risks, and of course, the fine print, including the price. To their credit, OpenAI is being pretty upfront about the potential dangers. They've put a big, high-risk label on some of its capabilities, especially in sensitive areas like biology and chemistry. This is particularly true for that deep thinking model. So to counter this, they've built in multiple layers of safety filters, they have human review teams, and they'll block accounts that try to misuse it. But, and this is important, it is not perfect. It's not foolproof. While the system is way, way harder to jailbreak than older models, it's not impossible. A really determined person using a complex, multi-step attack might still be able to get a bad answer out of it. So yeah, it's a massive improvement in safety, but you still need to be aware that it's not 100% infallible. Okay, now for the price tag. And for anyone who builds with the API, this is where things get really interesting. The pricing is, frankly, surprisingly competitive. I mean, just look at the costs for the mini and nano models. They are incredibly cheap. This is going to make these advanced AI tools so much more accessible to smaller developers, startups, and businesses that have to watch every penny. There's this quote from an early tester that I think just perfectly sums up the whole experience. They said it's like going from a low-resolution screen to a retina display, and that it's hard to go back. That really hits the nail on the head. This isn't just a small step up. It's a leap in quality so significant that once you've seen it, the old way just seems blurry and outdated. And that's really the heart of it. This isn't just about a longer feature list. It's a redefinition of what we should expect from AI. It's more intelligent. It's more intuitive. It's more integrated into everything. And now that we've seen this retina display of AI, the real question is, can we ever really go back? Thanks for joining me on this explainer.